Evidence Locker is sponsored by BetterHelp and Noom. BetterHelp is the world's largest online counseling platform. Evidence Locker listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com forward slash evidence. Noom helps people around the world enjoy healthier lives through better nutrition and exercise. You don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make big progress. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com forward slash evidence locker. You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Thank you for choosing our podcast. Our sponsors make it possible for us to keep bringing you new episodes. Please support them as they have some great deals just for you, our listeners. If you prefer to listen to ad-free content, simply find us on Patreon, where plans start as little as $2 a month. 25% of these proceeds are donated to the Doe Network, working to bring closure to international cold cases. For more information, follow the link in the show notes. Our cases deal with true crimes and real people. Some parts are graphic in nature, and listener discretion is advised. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. It was a cold January night when a hooded figure emerged from the woods and walked through the snow towards a family home in the small village in Sweden. Upstairs, the 23-year-old wife of a local pastor, Alexandra Fosmo, was asleep when the assailant entered her bedroom and fired three fatal shots. Moments later, her 30-year-old employer and neighbor, Daniel Linda, was awoken by the sound of his doorbell ringing. He looked at the time and saw that it was just after 4.30 a.m. Confused, he made his way to the front door and opened it, just to be shot in the face and chest. Unlike Alexandra, Daniel survived the shooting and managed to call for help. The investigation that followed uncovered a dark world of skewed religious views, infidelity, murder, and intrigue. All of these elements might make a good crime novel. But in the end, truth will always be stranger than fiction. Knutby is a small hamlet about an hour's drive north of Stockholm, Sweden. It's home to just over 500 people, mainly young families who have an appreciation for pastoral values of the country life. In 2004, one of the most beloved pastors of the local Pentecostal church was 30-year-old Helge Arnold Fosmo. Helge was born on the 27th of July, 1971, in Kristinam, Sweden. His Norwegian parents weren't particularly religious. But the young Helga found his way to Christianity through a local scout group. As a born-again Christian, he devoted all of his free time to church-related activities. When he was 17, he volunteered at a Christian youth cafe, where he met Helene Johansson, who would one day become his wife. Helga went on to study teaching, hoping to become a science teacher, but dropped out. Nothing came close to his greatest passion, which was religion. So instead of following a traditional career path, he became involved in Christian organizations like Word of Faith. In the mid-90s, he was employed as a youth pastor at the church where Helen was a member, the Pentecostal Church of Christinam. A Christian newspaper once reported about Helga's ability to speak in tongues. He was a fervent young believer who garnered the attention from everyone in the congregation and beyond. It was through church connections that Helge met Osa Valdau a passionate member of the Pentecostal church at Knutby. In 1997, Helga, Helene, and their two young children moved to the small town, where he would serve as a pastor. He was a fun-loving, energetic evangelist, with a great sense of humor, and settled in without any trouble. Some might say that at the time, the town of Knutby was almost indistinguishable from the parish of the Pentecostal church, Knutby, Philadelphia. And one can also say that Helga's life was indistinguishable from his calling as a pastor. The Fosmo's third child was born in Knutby, and Helene found herself alone a lot. Helga was spending all of his time with Osso Valdau, training and recruiting new members of their congregation. 
He started a charity foundation and Bible schools abroad in locations like India and Hong Kong. There was no stopping this dynamic young duo working for God. Like Asa, Helga saw himself as an expert when it came to interpreting scripture. In reading Psalm 45 regarding the Bride of Christ, Helga believed that God was communicating a message to him, that the Bride of Christ was in fact Asa Valdau. Helga vowed to do everything in his power to protect the Lord's betrothed until such a time that they were united. In March 1999, during a private ceremony between Asa and God, and Helga as the only witness, she accepted a self-purchased gold ring with seven diamonds. From that day forward, she was to be revered as the closest living being to God on earth. Helga later claimed that Asa forced him as her right-hand man to channel her godly husband and satisfy her sexually, using his hands. Asa denied this ever happened. But whatever happened behind church doors, Helga and Helene's marriage was taking a lot of strain. Helene begged her husband to spend more time at home with his family, but the more she asked of him, the more he retreated into his work. Sadly, before things between them could be resolved, Helene died in a tragic accident. She slipped in the bathroom, hit her head on the bathtub's tap, causing a fatal injury. Helga mourned for his wife and was suddenly a young, single father of three with an all-consuming job. Fortunately, he had the support of his church community, and while the women of the parish stepped in to help with the children, Helga could continue his work in service of the church. We'll take a quick ad break for a word from Evidence Locker sponsor, BetterHelp. We all know that life can be overwhelming at times. Many people are burned out without even knowing it. Symptoms can include lack of motivation, feeling helpless or trapped, detachment, fatigue, and more. Typically, we associate burnout with work, but that's not the only cause. Any of our roles in life can lead us to feel burned out, parenting, caring for a loved one, or just plain adulting. BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life and address the issue rather than the symptoms. I was matched with a therapist that is more or less my age, and speaking to a peer made me feel understood. Anna's empathy and guidance helped me to take back control of my mental well-being. Let's face it, life happens, and along the way, I'm sure something will come up again. But now that I'm aware of my triggers, I am confident that I will be mentally stronger in navigating my way through future challenges. BetterHelp has a network of qualified therapists ready to help. You can access customized therapy via video call, a phone call, or live chat sessions, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's also more affordable than in-person therapy, with the added bonus that I can talk to my therapist from the comfort of my own home. Start your therapy journey today and say goodbye to burnout. Evidence Locker listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash evidence. Now, let's resume today's episode. Within months, he had found love again, and wasted no time marrying his second wife, also his youngest sister, Alexandra, in November 2000. But tragedy seemed to follow Helga, when about a year into their marriage, he became sick with a mystery illness. He thought that an evil spirit had possessed him and decided to stay in bed, commanding around-the-clock care. Sarah Svensson, a pretty young blonde, was a smiling and obliging woman from Smallland. She was a devoted member of the church, and Helga appointed her as his full-time caretaker. In caring for Helga, Sarah moved into the bedroom with Helga, and Alexander was asked to stay in the guest room. Helga and Sarah stayed up nights, reading the Bible, praying, and sleeping together. A year after moving in with the pastor's family, Sarah divorced her husband. Helga assured Sarah that their affair wasn't a sin because they shared a heavenly love. She later recalled, Each night, we were winning a victory for God's will through sexual intercourse. To justify the presence of his mistress in his family home, Helga employed Sarah as a live-in nanny. Sarah was in charge of Helga's children from his first marriage, which meant she dealt with Helga more than with Alexandra. The nanny was completely taken in by the charismatic Helga and became convinced that she would be the next Mrs. Fosmo. However, as a pastor, Helga was not allowed to divorce Alexandra. So, in an act of desperation, Sarah took matters into her own hands. And in November 2003, 
attacked a sleeping Alexandra with a hammer. Alexandra survived the attack, but instead of alerting the authorities, the church leaders were called to the Fosma home. Helga's fellow pastors decided to deal with the crime in-house by ostracizing Sarah from the community and sending her away. They did not want to involve law enforcement because they feared that it would bring their church under public scrutiny. Besides, Alexander recovered and all was fine, so everyone simply moved on. Meanwhile, Sarah was in the deepest pit of despair. Not only was she shunned by the community that meant everything to her, Asa also made it clear that there was no longer a place for Sarah in God's home. As a sinner, eternal life would not be hers to have. The only person that took pity on Sarah was Helga, who stayed in contact with her. Although Helga had promised his fellow church leaders that he would break off all contact with Sarah, he found her cell phone in his house after she left. When she reached out to him, he arranged for them to communicate with him using her cell phone. This way, no one in the church would know he was still in contact with her. Sarah claimed that Helga told her that she had received an anonymous text to her cell phone, the one he was using in their communication, and forwarded it to her. The messages became more frequent, and she interpreted it as messages from God. Then, on January 10, 2004, emergency services received a call from Daniel Linda of Knutby. He was shot point-blank in the face and chest when opening the front door of his house. Because of his injuries and shock, he struggled to speak and handed the phone to his neighbor, who was able to communicate to the operator what had happened. The ambulance arrived shortly, and the neighbor assisted as much as he could and even ended up accompanying Daniel in the ambulance. The neighbor was none other than Helga Fosmo. As police scoured the area and knocked on the doors of all the surrounding houses, they discovered a second victim. Helga's wife, Alexandra, had been shot in her bed and was no longer alive. With two victims and an attacker on the loose, police brought in extra officers to deal with the case as a matter of urgency. It was curious to investigators that the closest friends and relatives of the two victims did not seem too distraught. Somewhat shocked, yes, but they all felt Alexandra had gone home to God and that Daniel was spared. Typically, a community would fear for their safety and hound police to bring the killer to justice. But this was not the case in Knutby. When police learned about the previous attempt on Alexandra's life, they were eager to speak to Sarah Svensson. But they did not have to look for her as she turned herself in two days after the shootings. Sarah confessed to the murder and attempted murder. She also confirmed the accusation that she had attacked Alexandra with a hammer in the fall of 2003. She explained to the police that she was acting on orders she received from an anonymous source via SMS. After being shunned by the community, she believed that the texts were prophecy and that by completing the set tasks given to her, her position in Knupi and ultimately in heaven would be restored. The messages, Sarah believed, came from God through Helga Fosmo. She described to police how she had purchased a firearm, made a muffler to serve as a silencer, and practiced shooting. According to Sarah, she parked in the woods outside Knutby and walked to the Fosmo home. After the shootings, she went back the way she came. She insisted that she acted alone and that no one helped her. The murder weapon was thrown in the Kalmar Strait, and after an extensive search, a police team was able to find it. They also located the muffler where Sarah told them she had disposed of it, in a trash can in Brigstad. A police informant, Farid Lamrani, also came forward, saying that he suspected Sarah had been planning the murder for a while. Lamrani claimed that he had trained Sarah to use the firearm she had purchased. Police suspected that it was Lamrani who had provided her with the pistol, but before they could question him further, he disappeared, and it is assumed he returned to his home country of Morocco. It was clear to investigators that Sarah had been severely brainwashed, and to her, being a religious outcast was the worst possible punishment. The text messages made her believe that she could come back into the fold, that God would forgive her and she could serve him and his bride, Asa, again. Bear in mind, in this congregation, death was not feared. It was seen as a necessary step one had to take, to enter their eternal existence in God's paradise. There was outside life in society, which was far from God, then Knutby, which was as close as one could get to God on earth, and then, after death, one would finally be home with God 
Tragically, this notion of coming home is what desensitized Sarah from the reality of the heinous crimes she was urged to commit. Police found Sarah's story strange, as she was adamant she was only acting on God's command. Especially when God was sending text messages to her cell phone, encouraging her to go through with the shootings. These were anonymous messages forwarded to Sarah by Helga Fosmo. Helga admitted to forwarding the messages, but said he received them from a private number. Like Sarah, Helga claimed that he only played his part in doing God's will. If that was in fact true, who then was sending the messages? In the two months leading up to the crimes, Helga and Sarah exchanged more than 2,000 text messages. And significantly, 18 SMSs and 10 voice calls in the 24 hours leading up to the crimes, and one damning phone call 15 minutes after Daniel was shot. Helga Fosma was arrested on January 28th on suspicion of murder and attempted murder. He fiercely denied any involvement in Alexandra's murder and the attempted murder of Daniel Linda. When police learned that Helga had also been having an affair with Daniel's wife Annette, they also arrested her, suspecting that she was involved too. However, due to a lack of evidence, she was released. To better understand the warped situation, investigators needed a better insight into the dynamics within the church community. The Knutby Philadelphia congregation was structurally part of the national network of the Pentecostal movement in Sweden. In 1992, Pastor Asa Valdau moved to Knutby from Uppsala after her husband left her for one of her closest friends. She was determined to devote her life to the church and encouraged fellowship and community within the church. Her congregation in Uppsala prevented her from serving as a pastor after her divorce, but Knutby Philadelphia provided her with an opportunity to start over, thanks to a visiting priest from the Church of Sweden who claimed he had received the prophetic message that Knutby needed a female servant who had suffered in life to lead the congregation. And so, she became reinstated and one of the most powerful figures in Knutby. Helga Fosmo was one of seven pastoral leaders. The small congregation only had 60 members, so the structure was perhaps a bit top-heavy. Asa and Helga ran a month-long Bible school in Knutby every year, and more often than not, people who attended ended up staying in Knutby for good. Members had to give 10% of their earnings to the church, ruled by the Bride of Christ, 36-year-old pastor Asa Valdau. In Judaism, the Bride of Christ is a term that refers to the people of Israel. In Christianity, the term refers to the congregation or church as a whole. Also, Valdau would later deny that she was ever called the Bride of Christ. But people who have left the congregation of Knupi claim that she is lying. Everything within that church centered around Asa to protect her until the second coming, when she would finally unite with her betrothed, Jesus Christ. After the shocking crimes of January 2004, the National Pentecostal Movement expelled Knutby Philadelphia because their beliefs were deemed unorthodox. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Now, you all have heard me raving about Noom, and if you haven't checked it out yet, do yourself a favor. All you've got to lose is, well, a couple of pounds and some inches, I suppose. Before Noom, my eating habits were all over the show. Some days I got so distracted and busy, I forgot to eat at all. And then came nighttime, and oh boy, did I make up for it, with huge portions of whatever topped with a dessert, because, you know, I had that poor me, I didn't eat all day voice in my head. But thankfully, Noom helped me to transition away from my questionable diet and become more mindful about eating. By that, I mean I think twice before choosing foods to eat. Logging my food forces me to take a moment to consider what I'm eating, and not simply go for whatever is in the fridge. Logging what I want to eat for the day ahead works great for me. This way, I know that if I stick to it, I can go on autopilot, still enjoy my food and not feel guilty, because I know my choices are all within my allocated calorie range. I've changed my understanding of what is good or bad for me, thanks to Noom's guidance. And swapping out foods means I can still feed my sweet tooth if I need to. If I have an off day, it's also okay. It won't set me off course, because Noom gently helps me to get back on track. With Noom's psychology-based approach, I understand my mind and body better. We all want to continue being healthy, right? And that's why Noom works. It's not a fad. It's not a resolution that won't last. It guides you to change your lifestyle by taking control of eating habits that no longer serve you. Join me and millions of others around the world who want to get into better shape going forward. Sign up for your trial 
and get psychology-based support to lose the weight for good at noom.com slash evidence locker. That's noom.com slash evidence locker. Now, let's return to today's episode. During their investigation, police learned about another untimely death that had occurred in the Fosmo home five years before. Helga's 27-year-old wife, Helene, was found dead in their bathroom after a nasty fall. It appeared as if she had collapsed forward into a bathtub, hitting her head on the tap, which caused a fatal head injury. In revisiting the incident, Helga told police that both he and Helene had a stomach bug on the day she died. They spent the day together in bed, and at one point, Helene got up to have a shower. Helga claimed he fell asleep. He woke up when a member of their congregation, Samuel Franker, arrived to check on them. Helga realized Helene was still in the bathroom. He went to check on her, but the bathroom door was locked. Samuel was with Helga and helped him to open the door. They found Helene, based down in the tub, and immediately called for an ambulance. Sadly, it was too late, and nothing could be done to save her. At the time, there was no investigation, seeming as it appeared to have been a tragic accident, and nothing more. However, after Alexandra's murder, Police reopened the case and found that Helene's head injury was not the cause of her death after all. She had a deadly amount of dextropropoxifene, a drug acting like morphine, in her blood. It had been ingested between 30 minutes and 5 hours before her death. Because the drug was in her blood, but not her stomach, and there were no needle marks in her arms, she must have ingested it either vaginally or anally. With the autopsy report and statements confirming that Helga was the only person with Helene in the lead-up to her death, he was charged with her murder. Everything came back to Helga. Although he was married to Alexandra, he was said to be God's chosen companion to the bride of Jesus, Asa. This meant he was a stand-in for her celestial soulmate and was occasionally called upon to satisfy her sexual needs. At the same time, Helga was also having an affair with Sarah, his children's nanny but ultimately, it was yet another woman whom he wanted more than anything. His neighbor, Daniel Linda's wife, Annette. Incidentally, Annette's brother Patrick Valdau was married to Asa. Here is how Helga described what all the women in his life meant to him. I'll be quite frank. These women meant different things to me. Alexandra was like a good friend or sister than a woman you share your life in your bed with. With Sarah, I knew somehow that it was only a matter of time before she would have to leave. There was something that everyone wanted to end because they didn't want her there. Sarah was, for the most part, a mistress, just for sexual pleasure. Annette was much more than that. And this meant that Sarah was no longer as close in that way, or as important anymore. Two months after Alexander Fosmo's murder, her widower Helga was officially charged with murders of his first wife Helene, incitement to the attempted murder of his wife Alexandra in 2003, and incitement to her murder in 2004, as well as incitement to the attempted murder of his neighbor, Daniel Linda. The crimes drew unprecedented media attention to the small town of Knutby. Once perceived to be a wholesome, God-fearing community, the uncomfortable truth emerged. It was likened to a sect, with blurred lines when it came to morality. The Bride of Christ, Asa Valdau, was running the show, and her unforgiving manipulation of members of the congregation was exposed. The public was shocked to learn the intricacies of the relationships within the church, and the media lapped it up, dubbing Helga and Sarah the pastor and the nanny. They wrote sensationalized articles with headlines like, she said she was the pastor's slave, and the nanny wanted to regain God's grace. The trial against Helga Fosmo and Sarah Svensson began on the 18th of May, 2004, in Uppsala District Court. Addressing Helene's murder, The prosecution argued that Helga Fosmo drugged his first wife and when she was unconscious, struck her head against the tap in the bathtub to make it appear like a tragic accident. His involvement in the death of his second wife, Alexandra, and the attempted murder of his neighbor, Daniel Linda, was presented together with Sarah Svensson's case as she had confessed to both crimes. In a tight-knit closed community like Knutby, going against one's fellow parishioners was unheard of. Yet many congregation members testified at the trial, providing context about the circumstances leading up to the night of the shootings. The prosecutor laid out the case as such. On January 10, 2004, Alexandra Fosmo was asleep in her bed when Sarah Svensson came into the bedroom and shot her, 
killing her instantly. Alexander had received two of the shots to the head and one to the leg. Then Sarah walked to the house across the road and shot Daniel Linda. Prosecution reminded the court that a subsequent investigation revealed that Alexandra's husband Helga and Daniel's wife Annette had been entangled in an affair. In the time leading up to the shootings, there was a multitude of messages between Helga Fosmo and Sarah Svensson. In less than two months, they exchanged over 2,200 messages and calls, averaging at 44 per day. The last of the messages were exchanged at the time of the crime. Although the messages had been deleted, Sarah told police what was said between her and Helga. At the time of the investigation, police were unable to retrieve the deleted messages from Sarah's Nokia 3510. Remember, this was in 2004, before smartphones and cloud storage. However, they eventually managed to crack it by retrieving some texts from Sarah's SIM card, sent between December of 2003 and February 2004. The content of these messages confirmed what Sarah had said, it was clear that she believed the messages were from God, guiding her to do His will. She thought Helga was simply a messenger who had forwarded the texts. However, the SMSs proved that it was Helga Vosmo playing God who had incited the murder and attempted murder. Helga claimed he never wrote the messages, but only forwarded them to Sarah, also believing that he was acting according to God's will. A reconstruction video was viewed in court showing Sarah Svensson calmly walking through the crime scene at the Fosmo house, describing step by step how she did it. When Sarah was called to the stand to testify, Helga was taken from the courtroom. He listened to her testimony from another room, but because of evidence of his influence over her, the court decided it would be better for her not to see him. The hope was that by removing Helga from the courtroom, Sarah would speak freely and truthfully. During her testimony, she recalled a conversation with Helga Fosmo sometime before killing his wife. This is a quote from her testimony. Suddenly, Helga said to me, If God were to tell you to kill a human being, would you do it? I thought it was a very strange question, but thought that if I really knew it was God saying it, I would have to obey. There would be no alternative. Sarah also said that Helga told her God wanted Alexander with him in heaven. Many conversations on this topic and completing God's plan were held between the two. Her testimony of her movements that night tied in neatly with the reconstruction video. The biggest conclusion drawn from this was that Helga Fosmo must have heard the gunshots that killed his wife, even though he claimed he never heard anything, until there was a commotion at Daniel's house. Helga Fosmo's defense attorney admitted that Helga was the one who had forwarded the messages to Sarah, but also interjected with his own texts that were intended as guidance and that Sarah Svensson had gone on to misinterpret them. However, months and months of messages show the level of brainwashing and manipulation at hand. For instance, this text sent on December 17, 2003. The first is your obligation. The other you can do out of love. It must be done some way or another. You would benefit from your selfless assistance unto him. You can do it. Four days before the crimes, a daily message containing scripture quotes was sent from Helga's cell phone to Sarah's. In hindsight, the texts appear to confirm to Sarah that she was going to act according to God's will, and because of that, would not suffer the consequences. Here are three verses sent on three different days. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8.1 there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8.31 What then shall we say is in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Sarah sent a message at 4.30, moments before the shootings, asking if she could call Helga. He simply replied yes. Helga claimed that the conversation was incoherent, that Sarah sounded confused, emotional, telling him she had completed her task. Lastly, Sarah received a message sent the day after Alexandra's murder and Daniel's attempted murder. Romans 12.12 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Asa Valdau, as Alexandra's sister, was also called to testify. She denied any involvement in the crimes and vehemently denied sending the messages to Helga who then forwarded them to Sarah. 
In an awkward gesture, she reached out for Sarah's hand. In that moment, the world stopped for Sarah. It was a sign that Asa had forgiven her and that she accomplished what she had set out to do to appease the Bride of Christ. The verdicts were handed down on the 30th of June, 2004. Sarah Svensson was found guilty and sentenced to forensic psychiatric care with a special discharge examination before she could be released. Helga Fosmo was sentenced to life in prison for incitement to murder and incitement to attempted murder, but he was acquitted of murdering his first wife, Helene. The Pentecostal movement finally distanced itself from the Canutby congregation, and they failed to adhere to an ultimatum, forcing the resignation of their pastors. The congregation was adamant to protect their leaders, and by doing so, Canutby became an independent church. With all the controversies surrounding the events of January 2004, however, things within the church changed for good. In 2016, after many years under the spell of their peers, two of the pastors left the town, and by implication, the church. Some members went on to join other congregations, and in May 2018, the once-was Philadelphia Parish disbanded for good. But the controversy was all but over. In 2019, four of the former parish's pastors were accused of abuse and defilement by eight different plaintiffs. This came about when one of the pastors, Peter Gimbach, went to police to inform him what he himself, as well as others, have done. One pastor, Urban Felt, who had replaced Helga Fosmo as Oz's wingman, was accused of sexually exploiting a 17-year-old girl in his care, convincing her he was caring for her soul. Asa Valdau was charged with biting a member of the congregation in the face, kicking her in the stomach, and banging her head against a wall. What started as a group of faithful, kind and caring individuals had turned into a cesspool for the ages. In 2020, former Pastor Peter Gembach was sentenced for assault and unlawful coercion to a suspended sentence with an 80-day fine. Asa Valdau was convicted of eight counts of assault and given a suspended sentence of 120 hours of community service. Urban Felt received a suspended sentence with community service for 160 hours for the sexual exploitation of a dependent person. He admitted to having a relationship with the girl, but denied the crime, stating she was not dependent on him. At the time of the crime, Urban was in his 40s, and his victim was only 17. The name Knutby has become a common use term in the Swedish language, serving as a metaphor. When the national soccer team presented a united front against the media by not discussing a personal dispute, one article had the headline, The National Team is like Knutby. Anton Berg and Martin Johnson, two Swedish journalists who studied the case for years, co-created the HBO docuseries Pray, Obey, Kill, revisiting the evidence and witness testimonies from all angles. In the documentary, the viewer becomes a fly on the wall of Helga Fosmo's interrogation back in 2004. He casually sits in a chair, smiles, and talks comfortably. At one point, he even invites the detectives to dinner, once the case was all over, of course. He does not appear to be distressed about losing his wife in the least, and converses freely about the insider politics of the church. Bergen Johnson also interviewed Helga recently, after many years in prison. He claims there was more to the murders than met the eye. He said he was threatened to comply with Asa's wishes, or his children would come to harm. Bergen Johnson also uncovered the unedited version of Sarah Svensson's reenactment video. It is chilling to see how rehearsed the recording is, and detectives can be heard suggesting certain things like adjusting the position from where she fired the shots, do it like we did during the dress rehearsal, prove that this was a production, not a police reenactment. Typically, a reenactment video is an opportunity for police to corroborate the victim's statement with their actions, and then go back and compare it to forensic analysis of the scene. However, this opportunity was lost, with Sarah doing what she was instructed to. And in fact, in the unedited version, there were many inconsistencies. For instance, the position next to the bed from where she claimed to have fired the shots does not link up with the evidence. The bullet wounds on Alexandra's skull were inflicted at close range. On the video, Sarah stands several feet away. She's adamant that she could not get any closer because she was terrified of waking Alexandra. This discrepancy was never revealed during the trial. Had the court known about this, perhaps they would have reached a different verdict. Another point of contention was Sarah's account of arriving and leaving the scene. 
According to Sarah, she drove into the woods, where she parked and left her car, and walked to the Fosmo home. Sarah said she left the way she came. However, this did not add up, as police dogs traced the footprints leaving Daniel Linda's house to a location in town, close by with fresh tire track prints in the snow. Was someone waiting in a car, ready to drive her away after the shootings? Did someone else move Sarah's car from the woods? If so, who was it? Helga was with Daniel. Could this have been Osa? Or perhaps one of her loyal followers duped into driving the getaway car? How many people were involved? In 2006, Helga Fosmo admitted to his role in his wife's death and the attack on Daniel Linda for the first time in a televised interview. However, he hinted at the fact that there was someone else pulling the strings. In a subsequent interview, he named this person to be none other than the Bride of Christ, Asa Valdau. He claimed that a linguistic examination of the anonymous texts he forwarded to Sarah proves that it was written by the same person who wrote the Tirza prophecy. Tirza, which was the name Asa chose after learning that she was the Bride of Christ. All members of the congregation addressed her using this name. The prophecy was a 14-page Microsoft Word document that reads like a letter from Jesus to his Tirsa. Asa Valdau and her supporters struck back, insisting that she had nothing to do with the crimes and that it was, in fact, Helga Fosmo who had written the Tirsa prophecy. After the crimes, Asa became somewhat of a celebrity in Sweden. She did countless TV and radio interviews, proudly explaining what being the Bride of Christ entailed. But the media pressure became too much and she was often ridiculed. Today, Asa Valdau is no longer a pastor and lives a life of seclusion. Her husband Patrick left her to be with the woman she assigned for him while she was coveting her betrothed. In Pray, Obey, Kill, journalists Anton Berg and Martin Johnson interview Sarah Svensson, her first media interview since the shootings in 2004. Sarah claims that the night of the shooting still haunts her. Mostly the fact that when she fired the first shot into Alexandra's leg, she didn't move. Here is Sarah's account. I've thought a lot about how it was, the first shot which hit Alexandra in the hip. There was nothing. There was no response. How can that be? I didn't understand. At the time, I thought it was because of me, because of something I did. But now, I don't know. Maybe she wasn't alive when I got there. Which begs to question... Was Alexandra already dead by the time Sarah shot her? Was Sarah manipulated to shoot an already deceased Alexandra, knowing that she was the ideal fall person? Did the actual killer or killers do the unthinkable, and in the end, get away with murder? We'd like to thank today's sponsors, BetterHelp and Noom. To get 10% off your first month of online counseling, go to betterhelp.com forward slash evidence. And go to noom.com forward slash evidence for psychology-based advice to enjoy a healthier life through better nutrition and exercise. Start your trial at noom.com forward slash evidence locker. That's N-O-O-M dot com forward slash evidence locker. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit us on social media to see more about today's case. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our channel on YouTube. If you like what we do here at Evidence Locker, subscribe in Apple Podcast or wherever you are listening right now and kindly leave a five-star review. This was the Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening. <laughs>